the show, Five Shark Fam. I'm AJ, and this is Michael. And wherever it is you get your pods, subscribe, share, and leave us a good rating. Welcome to another episode of Five Stripe Weekly. And yes, we have some rumors and some new MLS rules. And of course, a new MLS Cup winner with some familiar faces on it. And uh, before we get into all of that, uh, just a reminder uh, that you can join us on the Patreon, get in on the grassroots level and help us out. Uh, we have Gavin Marshall, Jordan Beck, Nal Faruqi, Andrew Wicke, and Chris James, who are some of our loyal supporters who have helped us on the Patreon. So go ahead and join that if you haven't already. But as well, uh, remember to subscribe here if uh, you are new, because we are trying to get to 10,000 subs. And so every little bit helps if you are not subscribed, which... The YouTube algorithm says many of you that are watching are not. Well, then go ahead and do it. We uh, post videos every week, and we also have a whole bunch of fun stuff coming up very soon. But anyway, so uh, getting into the news from this offseason. It is officially the offseason now. MLS pl Cup playoffs are over, and there is the champion, of course, the Columbus Crew. And those familiar faces are Darlington Nagby and Julian Gressel, who, boy, I mean, didn't we call it? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. it's just, uh, unfortunately, it sucks to be right, but, you know, it broke a lot of brackets in our Discord channel. But, uh, yeah, uh, you know, congrats to, to Niall for, for winning it in there. But it is, man, shoot, like... Losing to the eventual cup winners ain't too bad. It's uh, it's not the worst thing that could have happened. It makes us look better to a degree. But, uh, yeah, they just looked that good when they played us in uh, September. And uh, it was, man, <laughs> you just uh, you had this feeling that they put together a winning team, and they absolutely did. And Donington Nagby now has four MLS Cups. I mean... Oh, jeez. Like, uh, the, the real question is, is Darlington Nagby the best ever MLS player? I think there's an argument for him. But what do you think? Um, Because I don't really have a lot of, uh, like, other, um, you know, uh, dogs in the race or dogs in the fight in this. Um, I, I'll go with Darlington Nagby pretty easily then because, um, you know, there is no one else who I'm thinking like, oh, I definitely would want him to be the best ever. Um, I mean, there's some like exciting players, you know, you have Zlatan who was exciting. Um, you know, Jose Martinez, obviously very exciting to watch. Um, but, you know, does Jose Martinez have four cups? No, yeah. but Jose Martinez does have some. Uh, accolades, you know, uh, that accompany him everywhere he goes, not necessarily Darlington does because, you know, that's just not his position. I don't know. I think maybe they should have, you know, like uh, awards for uh, defensive mids and center mids, <laughs> but they don't really. So um, I don't know. I mean, it is there an argument? Yeah, probably. But like, you just have to really compare position to position. Um, and it's it's hard to do that. Like, how do you say? You know, this guy's a striker. He's the best to ever be in the league versus a, you know, defensive mid. It's like they just do such different things for teams. Um, you know, and then the publicity they get are just wildly different. Right. But I would say, and I, a lot of people who pay attention would probably say the same, Darlington Nagby is a sneaky engine for any team who wants to have a chance at winning the championship. It's that. It's like, you know, how many teams... Uh, fare much worse after he leaves. Uh, there is a bit of that, and um, you know, definitely Portland has gone through some dredges now, and uh, we clearly have as well. And uh, you know, obviously, we were still kind of good uh, the year before, and you know, definitely not the year after, but uh, but it is, you know, ultimately. Uh, yeah, you have maybe the likes of uh, maybe a, a Landon Donovan. You know, you have uh, you know some other multiple cup winners. But I mean, 
mean, just for him to do it on both coasts, on multiple teams, and, you know, that that's just the the crux of it. Like, he, he might be. Like, I don't know what we can say definitively, but uh, it's hard to, hard to not say Nagby at the moment. Freshest in memory, that's for sure. Is but, he the best to have played his position? I think so, in MLS. Yeah, for sure. I mean... Obviously not a big, big goal scorer, but a player that just runs the game for you. And it's clear that, you know, if you don't have him, he's super hard to replace. That much is clear. The value of having a DP level player at that position is just on display every single time he moves to a new team. And people still don't think, oh, maybe we shouldn't, you know, they still don't get around to thinking we should invest in that position. It's like, what are we doing? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you need somebody to run the game for you, and that's that's what he does. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's beautiful. That's, uh, yeah, if there was anybody that uh, I think I was okay with winning, it was the Columbus crew. And so, you know, I feel not as bad to a degree, but, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, moving on from that, uh, basically, as well, we will return to Magic City. Not that Magic City, uh, but the one in Alabama and Birmingham Legion. Uh, yeah, we will be playing in their home grounds uh, January 27th at Protective Stadium. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we already know one of our friendlies. That's interesting. Like, but I mean, we always knew. We always yeah. knew we were going back to Birmingham. Right. It's uh <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of a little rivalry as well uh between us and them. Because we haven't done so hot against them yeah, lately. Exactly. <laughs> like it's uh every time we play in the preseason it's like like yeah, we we should be doing better than this against a uh against a USL side, but alas, uh yeah, I mean, I, it's always I think a fun friendly as well in terms of uh an away day. So, you know, lots of our fans can uh, get over there and make it, yeah, you know, kind of a, a proper kind of, uh, you know, almost it feels like Europe. It feels like South America where you can actually have fans from both sides. And it's a little bit of a back and forth, you know, kind of like uh, when Club America played, you know, at our stadium as well. It was uh, a little bit of half and half. So, you know, definitely very very uh cool i think it was more of a home team advantage for club america yeah probably but yeah it's pr probably being generous uh to atlanta united uh yeah we we probably sold way too many tickets to uh you know club america fans but also some club america fans are also atlanta united fans and they have more allegiance to the club that they you know supported first so but, uh, but yeah, moving on from that into the transfer rumors. And first one is from Tom Bogert of The Athletic uh, talking about Miles Robinson. And he was visiting FC Cincinnati on the first day of free agency on uh, Wednesday, uh, 12th, 13th. But uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's definitely weird because I think a lot of fans did not take that news well. Uh, they are expecting him to go to Europe. Uh, they are not expecting him to go to another MLS club. We are currently the only MLS club that can pay him a DP deal. But as well, uh, you know, other teams can still put up a pretty big bid into uh, a pretty good salary. And yeah, I mean, to the Supporter Shield winners... I mean, there's definitely worse clubs to go to, but uh, I don't think as many fans would be rooting for Miles Robinson after that. They would be kind of salty. But, uh, yeah, how are you feeling about this news? When you see um, legendary club heroes go to play for a interconference team, that's always tough. It was tough when Joseph did it. You know, it's tough when other teams in our conference have players like you know, Nag being Gressel there, and also on Cincinnati, you have Brandon Vasquez. So it's it's tough seeing that happen. Um, prefer them to a minimum go to the West Coast, 
uh, but doesn't seem to be ha the case many times. Um, but preferably, I'd love to see Miles in Europe because I think that's the best way for him to develop his game and to be more of a, a weapon, an instrument for the United States men's national team going forward. Yeah, because, you know, uh, in terms of PSV Eindhoven, uh, the Eredivisie club. Uh, you mean you mean United States men's national team version pretty two? Much, pretty much, yeah. Uh, <laughs> for sure. Uh, yeah, lots of American players over there. But, uh, yeah, I mean, and, you know, to be fair, they, they're they in the Champions League and they're a pretty tough side, too. Uh, it would be a good landing spot for him, but uh, obviously the transfer window has not opened up yet. And so there is a bit of that, that, uh, you know, in terms of Europe, that, uh, yeah, I mean, weigh your options if you're Miles Robinson and, you know, get courted. But, uh, yeah, do you ultimately see him staying in MLS or do you see him going to Europe? And I saw him going to Europe. I just don't, I, it really kind of blindsided me with the Cincinnati talk. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just a little surprised. I was hoping something would just come through for him because I want to see him succeed, like I said. But, like, yeah, it was a big surprise. Um, I still expect him to go to Europe, and I'm hoping for that. But at, now this has made me kind of second-guess it, and I'm not sure anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, my preference is obviously, yeah. He, he should go to Europe. Uh, he would be wasting his prime, probably, if... Uh, if he did just go elsewhere in MLS, uh, it seems just kind of a uh, frivolous a endeavor. Move. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think he can and would get interest in Europe, even if it's not as a starter. I think you at least have to scratch that itch and see how far you can get. Try to win a spot. Try to you know um, earn uh, your stripes, essentially more or less but uh but speaking of fc cincy apparently according to cesar greco uh and uh diego fermino uh yeah it's cincinnati atlanta and fc dallas that are interested in a familiar name in midfielder eduard atuesta uh and yeah you know it's definitely very interesting because uh uh, they're saying for MLS, uh, Palmeiras, uh, the uh, club that he's at right now, only accepts it it's, if it's a permanent transfer. But, yeah, you know, I don't know if I trust the rumor as well, uh, but it is a name that we have, uh, of course, been linked with in the past. But three names in MLS, that's the fishy part because we have discovery rights over here, and so there's only one club that should actually be, you know, have the uh, the interest in him, uh, kind of like when Diego Rossi and uh, you know LA United and Columbus Crew were all uh, linked together. But it's like okay, well, there's only one club that actually has the rights, and it turned out to actually kind of be a little bit of both, where we had his dis discovery rights and we sold them off so that Columbus Crew could actually get them. But yeah, it's curious who has Atuesta's discovery rights but I mean in terms of Atuesta uh, do you think it's still a an attractive player that we should bring in I mean it's it depends and I'm hoping that Atlanta's scouting department is on their a game because this can be a tricky one uh, if we're serious about pursuing this player um, he's coming off of an injury I've heard a kind of serious one and he's been working himself back into playing in Pal with Palmyris and um so he had he's not he's still like a little bit rusty there he hasn't really gotten back to his normal state um and who knows how much of a lingering injury that could be for the future uh he's still like you know relatively you know like middle-aged in terms of soccer playing years um I think like 26 if I had if I remember correctly um, so not too old. I mean, that's kind of around where Garth likes to get players at. Um, so that kind of fits there. I mean, if you look at this guy's, you know, setup, the way he plays, where he plays, how he plays, he would fit pretty nicely with Atlanta. I mean, with it's like a pairing where he's the six, Tristan's the eight. Um, that could be pretty, 
pretty damaging. That could be pretty awesome to see. So I would like to see something like that. If it's not Add to West, it's something like that. Um, Add to West up would probably, I mean, so if you look at his market value, I think he was up at 5 million, but I don't think, I don't think you're gonna, I don't think Belmyris has the standing to really command that amount of money from someone. Um, but, you know, it is, it, it is what his market value says. If, you know, we're talking about 5 million, that's already in the DP range. Um, are we going to do, you know, are we going to pull the trigger on a DP in that position? I've always wanted to have a DP in. Um, if it's not at Tuesta, I hope it's someone. Um, and again, it's got to be on the scouting department and can, they can determine whether or not, you know, this guy's going to have a potentially lingering injury that could stop him from, you know, having an immediate impact in our next season or two. Um, it would suck to invest in a guy like that and then, you know, he never kind of really works his way back. So um, it's a it's an exciting prospect because it seems to me that we're looking to do the thing I've always wanted us to do, which is find a DP for that spot. So, you know, I'm crossing my fingers and hoping that they're going to land something like that in the offseason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Uh, there is that aspect, too, where uh, it's where the type of player he is, well, it's possible that he doesn't require a, uh, a DP spot, and if it if not, fantastic. Uh, he's a player with MLS, uh, you know, street cred, I guess, in that sense. And uh, yeah, of course, he's a veteran uh, of having played in this league, and so yeah, definitely that would be a good thing. That would be yeah, a pretty I think inspired pick. Uh, you know, when we have been linked to him in the past, I think it made sense. But obviously off of this injury, some question marks that might take down the transfer fee a little bit if, uh, if it came down to that. But uh, yeah, definitely very, very intriguing of a rumor. And, uh, you know, but just a rumor, not a yeah. lot to it yet. We'll have to see. Right. Uh, just a little bit of smoke. But uh, something that's not smoke is Josh Cohen. There was a bit of a rumor before he came. Uh, and, you know, of course, as well, there was the bit of a, uh, almost a lawsuit to a degree where, uh, yeah, he, there was a complaint filed against us for apparently holding him back from, uh, allowing him to sign in the summer with any team in MLS. But, uh, yeah, you know, those darn discovery rights, but we got our man, Josh Cohen, uh, American free agent goalkeeper. He is now a five stripe and he will be so through the 2025 season with an option for 2026. So, uh, you know, pretty much uh, possibly three years. Uh, but Cohen, he most recently played for Maccabi Haifa in the Israeli Premier League and uh, they won three consecutive league titles there. He was named the 2020 2021. Israeli Premier League player of the season and made six appearances in the UEFA Champions League uh, in the 2022-2023 season. So, uh, Cosmo Konega, he mentioned, uh, Josh is someone with a unique career path who has backed himself at every step of his journey. He has shown the ability to compete at the highest level in Europa League and Champions League. We're pleased to welcome Josh to the club and look forward to him coming in and competing within our goalkeeping group. Just very interesting there. I mean, he's 31 years old, 6'1 goalkeeper. Uh, yeah, you know, obviously, Brad Guzan, 39. He has an option, and we're waiting to see if he actually is going to, you know, uh, take it up and join this goalkeeping group. Uh, but, yeah, to kind of get this guy who, by all accounts, is not going to be a DP, uh, you know, probably make into the hundreds of thousands, but also provide, like we were mentioning in other episodes, that competition at goalkeeper. It seemed like that's kind of the route that we were going to go with. And yeah, you know, have have a guy that uh, can learn from the likes of a very seasoned player like Brad Guzan. Maybe not the bad, uh, maybe not the worst thing, especially if he's not maybe playing the most. But also, yeah, he's a type of player that seems like shot stopping is a, uh, a good ability of his and, you know, can stop a penalty, which 
is really good <laughs> when we really need it sometimes. But uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on uh, Josh Cohen and him officially being a five strike? Well, first of all, welcome, Josh. Welcome to the team. We're excited to see what you have for us. Um, yeah, it's it's. Um, I mean, let's be real. The Israeli league is not very competitive. Uh, I think they have they're pretty top heavy with like maybe two, possibly three teams that pretty much win all the time. Um, and you know his team is one of them. Um, yeah, you can do really well <laughs> as a goal as a goaltender on a top team against not that great of opposition. Can get a lot of clean sheets. You can do. Uh, a lot of stat, you know, pat, uh, stat padding and things like that. Um, so, I don't know if this guy's a paper tiger or not. I mean, you know, when you put him in, you know, European competition, you know, in the uh, like you mentioned the uh, Champions League or Europa League and stuff like that, he holds because their team is not just is just not that good um, comparatively. I mean, I mean. No, none of the MLS teams are going to do well in those tournaments either. So there's that for reference. But I do think the MLS is a is a uh, cut above uh, the Israeli Premier League, and so it'll it'll it remains to be seen if he can really strike out here um, as a as Bocas as a unique talent or a unique uh, career trajectory for him. Um, so. Yeah, um, I'm a, I'm cautiously optimistic with him. He's younger, he's spry, he can get to the balls he needs to get to. He's got sh stop, he's got shot stopping power. Um, you got all the things for the recipe to make a good goalkeeper. And honestly, from what Brad was cooking with, I feel like it's gonna be a step up, and that's great and all. Is he gonna be like a? you know an mls goalkeeper that's everyone knows the name of like a sean johnson you know um oh my god what's the guy's name on philadelphia anyway you know what i mean the uh, yep. the guys who stand like glaze like those types of players who yeah, everyone like, knows their name crep out like you know the guys everyone who the guys who are just like ah we gotta go up against him today you know yeah. so like hopefully he becomes one of those household names like that but i i'm not sure i'm not sure it's balance of probability probably says he won't but i think he's going to be at least good enough to you know be the difference maker in some of the games whereas unfortunately brad was not able to do that so it'll be a boon definitely um and we'll see where it goes from there i just really hope he develops into like a everyone knows this guy's name but it's like yakamakis right everyone learned his name real fast so well, hopefully it'll be something similar like that. Yeah, and yeah, it's definitely um, it's definitely a, an intriguing uh, transfer, and uh, you know, in terms of signing, and it's just something that uh, you know, the, the type of player. Um, obviously, he didn't play in the Premier League like uh, Brad Guzan. Um, I would say, you know, as well though, obviously. Uh, Braguzan didn't play in the you know the Champions League, didn't play in the Europa League either, um, you know. But Braguzan was part of the U.S. Men's National Team for a really long time, and uh, Josh Cohen, you know, uh, kind of peripheral. Good point. Yeah. You know, he's got some uh, experience there, but not a ton. And he I went think to that's... one camp, I think. He's never had an appearance for the United States. He's only been to one camp. Yeah, and so definitely. You know, uh, as well, Brad Guzan, he came here around the same age. And, um, you know, it's definitely, you know, I, I think it's a player that has intrigue. I don't know if he will truly be maybe better than Brad Guzan at his peak for us. But I think... Uh, that's hard. That's yeah. hard to do for anyone. I mean, Brad right. was like a cut above from yeah. most goalkeepers. <laughs> yeah, and... For obvious reasons now, uh, you know, he isn't. And Josh uh, could be a player that at least can provide some stops when we really need it. And that hasn't been happening, obviously. And that's why, uh, yeah, alluding to the mailbag, yeah, we'll have a bunch of questions in regards to all this. So we won't, you know, sit on this too long. So, but uh, yeah, so let's move on. 
uh, to some new MLS rules that MLS came out with and uh, the Board of Governors met on Thursday. They announced the following new sporting and competition initiatives that will be uh, implemented ahead of the 2024 MLS season. Uh, I won't go really, really uh, deep dive into it, but uh, some of them being the off-field treatment rule, uh, as well as the timed substitution rule, in-stadium VAR announcements, uh, stoppage time clock, return to play equity, and uh, some also some roster and budget guideline updates, uh, including a reduction of the discovery slots like we were talking about earlier uh, from 7 to 5. So that will allow for a little bit more where, yeah, you get those rumors of... Uh, say Atuesta and it'll make a little bit more sense it's like okay well that might be possible now but um, and as well some uh, TAM eligibility parameters but uh, yeah uh, the commissioner did mention that there is not going to be a fourth DP so uh, boo but also uh, I guess yeah it'll be really really interesting I, I think there was something that you tweeted that I feel like is uh, pretty apropos and uh, pretty funny. But uh, yeah, if you want to, you know, say that right now, because I think it's, man, like that's yeah, uh, so it's funny. <laughs> when David Beckham joined the league, it was revolutionary. I mean, they added the four, you know, they added all the DPs, changed things pretty immensely. Um, when Lionel Messi joined the league, they just made it so you got to hustle off the field a little bit faster. It's Big just, deal. Best right. player in the world versus a guy who's, yeah, a great player, but not the best player to have ever played the game. So, and would command just an insane amount of eyeballs and money. Like, this is this is the evolution you go through after bringing him on board versus when you've been, you've had such a massive evolution with a... I mean, let's be real, a a less significant player. I mean, Beckham was significant. Sure, of course. Obviously, I'm not saying he wasn't. I'm saying that he's just less significant than Messi because everyone basically is. So, like, it's it, it kind of blew me away that we're not using this as a flashpoint, an opportunity to really, you know, burst some, some things open and be like, okay, let's take the training wheels off finally and let us go. You know, some teams are ready to go. Clearly, this has to do a little bit. Some of the commentary in line is about this is kind of more um, uh, conservative and um, not want like risk adverse owners in the league kind of holding things back because a lot of them are kind of on the panels and the uh, the councils that are in charge of making some of these decisions. You know, I'm not going to really comment on that stuff too much. Um, but if that is just plain and simply what's going on, obviously that's bad. We need to get some movement there so we have more ambitious leadership um mm -hmm. now <laughs> um the uh the rules that were implemented um i think are generally you know the gameplay rules i think are generally improvements and good i'm glad that they're there um but like i said the negative and the talking points of ever of all this really came down to there not being an added fourth dp or um you know a larger cap space and things like that i think that's just a huge you know um swing and a miss for mls there so let's talk about the additions to the on-field rules um you know when you have to make a substitution you have 10 seconds to get off the field i think that's fine keeps the game moving um you know we don't have to have players pushing other players off the pitch to get the ball moving again and you know you know people just time wasting it's i mean a lot of this isn't an effort to reduce time wasting which i'm all for um and then the other one uh was you know the 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 they call it like they try to frame it in this way of like it's, we're worried about the players we don't want any injuries but to me when i read it it's like all right no flopping allowed like yeah. if you're hurt <laughs> you're hurt and you're gonna go off the field and if you try and act like you're hurt and you're not hurt you're still gonna get essentially penalized for it by you have a minimum of two minutes you have to get off the field if you're down for more than 15 seconds so no more of this like i'm gonna roll around for 15 seconds and hope a call gets whatever or get you know the whistle gets blown or something it's like well if it does you're looking at two minutes minimum 
and and if that was a flop now your team is hamstringed so like you know i i like that instigation i like that rule um we'll see how it plays out obviously we have to see how these things are are uh, uh reality tested first but on paper they look good what do you think yeah i mean uh it, there, there is that. There's definitely, I think, some uh, in, ter in terms of the last rule that you're talking about, because um, that's what I'm reacting to more so. Is there, there can be some misinterpretation, and I feel like uh, that's where, um, yeah, you know, obviously we have some players that don't get every single call, and yeah, it was more so prevalent when we had uh, Marcelino Moreno and. Luis Arujo, and yeah, you know, they would just get hacked down, and yeah, you know, it's like, okay, well, they stayed down because they didn't get the call, and now they're getting penalized when sometimes I feel like, yeah, you know, they, they, they stayed down because they weren't getting those calls that they felt like they should have been, and, uh, you know, I think we all know that refs are not infallible, and they have definitely been uh, uh, very error prone. And you know that's that's part of the game, but it is also um, I think it's kind of letting them off the hook still. Like refs, I think there there's, there needs to be a little bit more uh, where they don't control so much because. The whole two minutes, it's like, okay, well, you know, the fourth official is going to have to, you know, uh, handle that. And then uh, what if it's longer than that? Then, you know, <laughs> I think everyone has grounds to be pissed uh, because the next stoppage, the next stoppage in, in play, like, it, it opens up some things that I don't know if they've actually completely thought about. And, uh, you know, Listen, obviously. they tested all of this in MLS <laughs> Pro, so right. next, so of course it's gonna work. Right, and it's uh, yeah, that's what they claim anyway. And it's like, okay, well, you know, um, you know, we'll we'll say we'll say sure, but uh, you know, you have much savvier players. Okay, say, for instance, you have a Sergio Ramos <laughs> versus, say, uh, Miles Robinson, right? Like one player is going to be really good at knowing how to waste time and exploiting things. Miles Robinson, not really that versed in the dark arts. It's <laughs> there's there's going to be some things that uh, yeah players like Ramos will have thought about and you know will like Sergio Ramos is a player that uh, you know basically. It's on that level of, okay, uh, sure, there's some yellow card accumulation. Uh, he's going to strategically get a yellow in order to miss a certain match so that he will be available for a more important match. Like, it's stuff like that, you know. And, man, like uh, some of the other stuff as well. Um, I think, yeah, it does make sense. The uh, head injuries, you know, that type of stuff uh definitely protection on that super important uh but in terms of uh yeah kind of like the gam tam stuff uh it gets into some level of stuff that just i don't think we need to get into uh it's it is, fairly incidental I, yeah. I believe at least from my reading so i don't think it's like again it wasn't the heavy hitting big uh financial revelations we were expecting so and i don't think it really matters too much Right. But uh, one of the interesting ones as well is the residency deadline. So for a player to be considered a domestic player uh, in a season, uh, his residency must be established or the player has to have appeared for an immigrant visa, uh, visa rather, uh, interview by the opening of the secondary transfer window. And so, yeah, definitely like loosening up a little bit of that I think helps. Like that's a... Uh, a factor that uh, definitely opens it up for us because we yeah, it, don't. It's hurt a man in the past. Yeah, exactly. Like we're not a team that uh, always goes for just the American players or any of that. Like we have a fairly multicultural team, and uh, this definitely helps us. But uh, but yeah, uh, you know, I, I think you know there's some good changes. We'll see what the ramifications are or consequences or whatever you want to call it 
uh, are after these have been implemented. But yeah, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I'm gonna have my phone out when players go down and get that timer started. Yeah, right. Exactly. And I'm gonna see at 14 seconds that the guy pops up real quick. Mm-hmm. I wonder I mean, if they're gonna practice that. Think about it. It's like in your mind. Like remember, you got 15 seconds. Uh huh. You gotta make that decision. Is this a real injury or not? <laughs> I'm sure after the first uh, week or two, uh, after it's been, you know, talked about a lot, that uh, yeah, that will probably get curbed a little bit. And so yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of flopping, in terms of uh, you know players rolling around for longer periods of time to uh, you know stop play when it's advantageous for the opposition, I get it, and you know, hopefully it does actually help curb that, but. Uh, but yep, moving on from that uh, into the 2024 MLS Super Draft. Uh, I know many of us don't really, really care too much about it because we haven't drafted anybody really too significant uh, in quite some time. But probably but since. reminder, we've gotten two really key pieces yeah. from the Super Draft in the past. So you never know. You never know. Uh, although it is one of those things where... Uh, the, the level of player uh, available in the Super Draft now is a lot less. Uh, they are generally either signed to academies or, uh, you know, drafted into, uh, you know, kind of other leagues in USL and all that as well. So uh, it's, though, we have the f- first round pick of uh, number 19. And uh, we have some obvious needs uh, in some depth positions, possibly for center back, goalkeeper, maybe uh, maybe a left back. Who knows? But uh, yeah, definitely it will be kind of uh, an interesting thing to see if we pick up a, anybody of note. But it will be next Tuesday at 3 p.m. So, uh, but yeah, any uh, any thoughts on that? Any thoughts on the super draft? I'm trying to think who like what. Where the de- I don't have the depth chart in front of me that we have currently, but I mean, depending how the center backs shake out, we could perhaps get one there um, from the super draft. I mean, again, MLS doesn't prioritize their defense typically, so that's oftentimes where you'll see a lot of super draft people go. So, um, unless you're Miami and you grab Robbie Robinson and put him up top, and then he's terrible for, for a long time, and then you get Lionel Messi to play next. So that was fun to see. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the, that's the thing. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very hit or miss, clearly. And uh, yeah, I feel like having a center back from the, it, you just, they're not going to have enough uh, experience probably still to play in MLS nowadays. So it's tough. Like it took Miles Robinson a couple years. Like I, I just don't, I don't see. And you're oh. going up against Messi now. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, that's it's, yeah. It's just not. I, uh, we'll see. We'll see how how relevant uh, the Super Draft can be uh, going forward. But yeah, probably probably not. But uh, so anyway, that does it for the news, and it gets us into the mailbag. And you guys send in your questions through IG Story. Please continue to do so, and we might answer your question in the future. So, first question is, uh, let's see, lots of questions. Uh, Gusta Moraku, <laughs> what a name, uh, asks, is Guzan gone? And I think we uh, mentioned it earlier, but uh, yeah, still undecided. He's going to let us know in terms of not us specifically, obviously, but LA United uh, know if he is going to, uh, you know, uh, pretty much there's, a, I believe, a mutual option. But uh, yeah, Guzan, not gone yet. I know a lot of people want him to be gone, but uh, I know you kind of talked about it a little bit, but do you feel like uh, the, I guess, timeshare or... Uh, just a battle for the go- starting goalkeeper spot uh, would, is the wisest move. I think so. With yeah, I just think it. Yeah, I think that's probably the wisest move. Um, you, like you kind of hinted at earlier, Josh still has some things to learn, and he can learn them from Brad Guzan. So having them, you know, maybe do 50-50 of the season, um, probably not a bad idea. 
Brad probably can't do a full season anymore. Um, maybe this will make him better um, because he can devote, you know, his powers to the games he does play in. Whereas Josh can pick up the slack when Brad is not there. So, and also maybe <laughs> be funny if Brad becomes like a cup cup goalie or something like that. Um, I mean, could definitely have worse goalies for cup games um, like US Open Cup and other things like that. So, um, yeah, it's uh, if, if it, they split it 50 50, I think that's probably where they're gonna go, and I think I'm probably pretty fine with that. Like I said, Josh has still some things to learn, but I mean, he does come with a good amount of experience at a significant level. So, I mean, I I thought we may have gone a little younger, um, but I'm actually okay with it. I mean, I do pretty much want a goalie to be able to take over the reins if not this year next year immediately and to hit the ground running be able to be a a literal championship level goalie for us because that's where we're aiming for and you got to be on the same page with us yeah i think there were years that we skewed a little too young obviously rocco rios novo uh and way yeah. too young yeah yeah and obviously though uh you know he did win a uh you know, a championship with Phoenix Rising, but I think ultimately, you know, that's that's a level that's below for obvious reasons. That uh, is not exactly quite what we want. But um, yeah, next question comes from Smoky Karaoke. Love that name. Uh, is bringing Gressel home a priority for the front office slash Garth Lagerway? Um, I'm going to say no. I don't think we're going to go back to that well again. Um, uh, that And that's mostly because I think he's just going to ask for more than we're willing to pay. Um, and we're pretty good on pieces in the spots at Gressel. I mean, yeah, he's a Swiss Army knife. He can play multiple things. But um, in his prized position, I think we're pretty good on that right now. So... It would be a little redundant for me. I mean, if, you know, who are you going to pick Brooks and Gressel to start then at that point? Um, and I don't think either one is would be happy with, um, you know, being on the bench as a second string. So, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I just don't see it. I don't see it happening. Mm -hmm. It's also, yeah, I mean, uh, Gressel in the past, he's talked about uh, liking to play midfield, but I just don't see him as a central midfielder. Uh, like he's kind of always been more of a right wing back and he has his defensive deficiencies unfortunately as much as we all love Julian Russell he we we exposed him <laughs> we exposed him in uh in our match uh you know at the bends against them and he didn't start a game after that uh, yeah obviously there weren't a ton of games but it I think uh Wolfred Nancy he realized they were they were significant important games yeah and you know i think there's also a reason why he uh, was not uh re-upped they didn't pick up his option and uh yeah i mean it's okay well uh you know you have a player that obviously has really good attributes and qualities but is he a fit like you not not a ton of teams play with wingbacks anymore uh in this uh in this modern game and so uh you know like it's it's gonna take a particular team that can utilize his talents, and you know maybe it's Inter Miami. Like uh, there's a bit of smoke that he might sign there. That would be very interesting. A reunion with Tata Martino. So uh, yeah, that that would also suck. I don't want to see him there either. But yeah, it is what it is. If it if it happens, it um, <laughs> he would have just missed Joseph. Exactly. That would have been, you know, and maybe maybe they go somewhere in the West Coast where uh, they can link up again. Who knows? Uh, yeah, no go idea. join Eric Rometty in San Jose or something. They need help. Right. That, maybe LA Galaxy or, yeah, who knows? Who really knows? But um, I could maybe. see Gress on LA Galaxy. I don't think I'd see Martinez on LA Galaxy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting. Uh, I mean, I think Joseph Martinez does like a warmer weather spot probably and uh you know flashy so yeah, possibly but um yeah uh next question comes from chambre poppy 
what away game do you want to see on the 2024 schedule? So obviously our, not obviously maybe, uh, yeah, our uh, new schedule is going to be announced on December 20th. But, uh, so we have no idea what the games actually will be. But I imagine uh, there will be some teams that we will uh, see on the West Coast that we haven't seen for some time, uh, at least one season. But, uh, yeah, do you have any, like, would it be, you know, maybe Portland? Would it be uh, maybe, uh, you know, maybe some one of the teams in Texas? Maybe um, L.A.? I'd say, first of all, probably any team with turf uh, would be acceptable for me because I get our guys essentially play well on turf. So mm -hmm. that would be okay by me. So that's like a Seattle, you know, um, that would be good. Um, I mean, we hurt Seattle, Seattle pretty badly last time we were there. Um, I, and also just like, let's go get some scalps, right? Like if we want to go after some big name teams in the West to make a statement, you're gonna go after you know the the LA teams, um, not so much Portland anymore. Sorry, Portland, Seattle, obviously, like I said, um, and Minnesota's kind of fall off a little bit. Um, but anyway, the big guys in the West, the, it, it would be fun to see us go up against the heavy hitters there, um, and just take some scalps. We'll see if we can do it and uh, on in hostile territory. It's good practice, see different styles, play different teams. Um, I don't like yeah you want to say like again here's the thing yeah we want to get maybe an easy schedule against our western opponents right like you want to get low tier teams get easy three points come home etc right but i want to go for you know the championship next year and that means we have to be able to beat top teams regardless of what conference they're in so if we get put up against lafc or something like that like we did last season, I want to go there and I want to win. I want to see the proof with my own eyes, right? That we went to these hostile territories and we beat them. That's what I want to see. I don't want to see, oh yeah, we, we, you know, skated by with a one goal win against like, you know, the white caps or something like that's, it's like, who cares if yeah. you go there and beat LAFC, then it's like, all right, Elena's got something to say to the league right now, and that's what I want to be doing next season. Which uh, we played it at uh, the LAFC Stadium. Uh, name is escaping me right now for some reason, but no, uh, the bank. Yeah, Bank of California, or yeah, uh, either way. Um, yeah, it's basically though. Uh, so unlikely we would go to that one. I think we probably would be going to. RSL Stadium, maybe, maybe uh, Houston Dynamo, but also, I mean, the way Chambray Poppy uh, mentioned this uh, question as well, I mean, I kind of geared it towards the West, but it could be a team in the East as well, and, uh, you know, Nashville, always a good away day, too, uh, Orlando, for some people, uh, not Air me. Friends in Charlotte, another warm <laughs> visit. Yeah, exactly, but... Uh, you know, I, I think for me, um, yeah, just a, a trip out to, to California would be fantastic. Uh, again, uh, you know, I think uh, for, you know, LA Galaxy, maybe. Uh, seems like that might be an away game that's, uh, yeah, you know, I think it's Carson City there. And, uh, yeah, you know, I, I kind of want a good warm away day and, like, actually go out there, so selfishly i kind of want that but <laughs> uh next question comes from uh kct photography uh who will step up and lead this team moving forward i'm assuming the captain is what he's saying yeah if not brag Uzan, who yeah it's gonna probably be brooks lennon um i just think he's earned the spot he seems to have grown into the role a bit. Um, there's a shout for Yakamakis. He just doesn't really have the seniority with the team, uh, the longevity that you really kind of need. Um, he's not just going to walk onto the team like Messi did and take the captain's armband when he ever shows up. But, um, you know, like, I mean, Yakamakis, don't get me wrong. He's definitely a leader. He's definitely 
a voice probably in the locker room and definitely on the field we saw what he did when zonde missed that uh sitter last year um or last season um, I mean, the guys definitely got leadership capabilities. I mean, striker from European, you know, Celtic team that, you know, they've seen a lot of adversity and he's gotten through it. So, and in uh, the Dutch Everdyes as well, you know, this guy's cut his teeth on some pretty hard rocks. So, like, he has the capability of being a captain and maybe in the future that will be what happens. But I think at least right now, Brooks has earned it and he has the ability to do it. And I trust in his very capable hands, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, it's uh, it's it's almost de facto, probably yeah. at this point too, though, because uh, you look at up and down the team. Yeah, there hasn't been many players that have been on the team very long uh, after that. And yeah, I mean, maybe the next person uh, in terms of, I guess, importance and. You know the player that probably would see the most minutes. I think that's the problem with Yakumakis is that he gets injured a good bit or gets yellow card accumulation, and so Brooks Lennon has been our most consistent player in terms of availability, and I think that goes a long way too. So uh, yeah, Brooks Lennon makes the most sense. Uh, maybe a Tristan Muyamba, maybe in terms of importance, like as a player that maybe is part of the leadership group possibly but beyond that all the other guys haven't been on the team very long slash yeah who knows who's going to be on the team it's yeah that's yeah, it's interesting question. in soccer they don't do they don't do like in hockey you have like assistant captains yeah. um so you know it'd be you know i mean if you talk about assistant captains, i would definitely put yakamakis on there i'd definitely put tristan on there so right mm -hmm. uh or like vice captains, uh, I guess what they, they call it there. But um, yeah, let's see. In terms of, there's a lot of questions about how we can improve or win the MLS Cup next season or replace Miles. Win DP6. <laughs> DP6 or DP8, please. Right, exactly. That's how it's done. Darlington right. Agby, he showed us the way. Mm -hmm. Like, Come yeah. on. Yeah, we, we definitely. And so, yeah, we can answer that one. I, I think uh, that one... It, you know, we've talked about it, I think, a good bit. Uh, the central midfield role, the uh, you know defensive midfielder role, it's very important. Um, it seems like Muyambo can fill one of them. Uh, you know, he, he's seemingly a little cross between a six and an eight. Uh, but you know, maybe maybe we do need a little bit of size in there, uh, just as kind of the, a different dynamic, and so. Yeah, maybe more of a destroyer type of type would be actually, you know, a, a different look that we actually could really use, really utilize. But uh, as well, of course, uh, yeah, we need to kind of fill out the coffers in terms of depth because we are very late now, obviously, by the end of the season. I think we can find some, uh, you know, some good backups or at least maybe not backups, Maybe in the way that uh, uh, Mikel Arteta with uh, Arsenal got 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 a got a reference in. There we go. Uh, but <laughs> the yeah, one every uh, episode, one every episode. But uh, calling them finishers, and I think it's you know it's a very awesome concept of making sure that uh, anybody who comes into the game feels the urgency and the uh, importance of the occasion. In which case you're on the pitch to make a difference and so uh not just you know it's not it's not basketball it's not nba where you know it's garbage time like it's actually you know to finish games sometimes you need players that can actually make a difference for you so and the poster boy right now for us is edwin muscara boy did i not ever think i'd say that exactly and <laughs> yeah something we didn't speak on is uh yeah they're playing in the uh an international window uh, to a degree pretty much some friendlies and um yeah you know uh basically mascara uh he's been getting on with uh with colombia and uh you know tiago mata he's training is with it the first Argentina. team with colombia it's the u uh i believe the u23s 21 21 yeah, okay maybe u21s either way um yeah so he's uh he scored a goal as well it's yeah you know it's good stuff and um 
Yeah, he's he's having a resurgence from uh, looking like he was left for dead a little bit when uh, he went out alone. So really great stuff from Mascara for sure. You love to see it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But, Redemption arc. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, that's the the last question there from the mailbag, and uh, yeah, great looking forward. Yeah, this week, guys, keep really them coming. Stuff. And uh, yep, uh, we look forward to what you guys are gonna ask us next week. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much the entire episode, except for the question of the day. And the question of the day is: Would you have preferred a bona fide starting keeper, or are you okay with a battle for the goalkeeper spot, like we are doing with Josh Cohen and possibly Brad Guzan? In which case, mostly it has been reported that uh, Brad Guzan probably will be fighting with him for the spot. So, yeah, definitely very interesting. We'll look forward to what you have to say in the comments below. But And guys, also tell AJ what you want for Christmas, and I'll do my best to make sure it happens. Uh, yeah, we're, uh, I'm apparently uh, Santa AJ. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> nope, uh, wish we th had that kind of revenue. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so, guys, that is the episode there and there. And remember to like, share, comment, subscribe. I've been AJ. That's been Michael. Thank you so much for watching. And we will see you in the next video. Oh